Welcome, welcome everyone. Welcome to this special webinar event in collaboration with Advanced Orthomolecular Research and Fullscript. I'm Amy Regan from Fullscript and I'm so glad that you've joined us today. A few housekeeping notes. Please place all questions you have in the Q&A box for a chance for them to be answered at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and the recording will be sent via email to all attendees and registrants, as well as available to watch at fullscript.com slash webinars within a couple days. There is a copy of the presentation slides in the handout section for you to follow along as well. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Navdarat Nibber, naturopathic doctor, is a graduate of the Canadian College of Naturopathic Medicine and a registered naturopathic doctor and naturopathic honor award recipient. Dr. Nibber is a medical advisor, research liaison, and brand educator for ortho advanced orthomolecular research. Engaging with international research in the naturopathic field and is a published health expert in over 25 international publications. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And um, thank you for allowing us uh, to delve into this discussion. Um, that is a, a wonderful introduction. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Dr. Navneer Nibber. I'm a naturopathic doctor um, and the senior medical advisor for AOR. We work um, with a number of institutions and universities in our research capacity. Um, so I am working diligently on getting more research studies on nutraceutical ingredients. AOR is a completely independently owned Canadian manufacturing facility of quality supplements for over 30 years. Um, we are family owned and operated and um, it's my pleasure to do this presentation alongside them. We have quite a lot to cover today relating to a much deeper understanding of something that is an incredibly complex and dynamic relationship that exists between our mitochondrial functioning and cellular outcomes of energy metabolism. This presentation is really going to be an overview and an introduction and I really hope to provide those insights on how we approach um, this with a lens significantly focusing on the mitochondrial functioning. So strap in, I'm gonna be speaking like a Gilmore girl just to get through all of this information. Um, and to understand really, I just wanna start with that basis of metabolism and understanding the concept of metabolism, which encompasses these catabolic and anabolic processes that are set, um, that maintain the homeostasis and some of those anthropomorphic parameters. When we're considering metabolic functioning, especially um, with patients, they're considering it's in relation to their body composition, fat to muscle ratio, BMR, movement capacity, um, sometimes energy functioning, the muscle functioning, cardiovascular respiratory, and, and much more. So again, the metabolism component on um, a grand scale deals with those organ systems, tissue, and, um, and there's many aspects of metabolism to consider, as we know, you know, hormonal functioning, Etc. But um, really, those that underpinning um, is is in relation to that intimate connection with the mitochondria. The mitochondria sort of acting as that general of metabolism, if you will. These mitochondria are very complex organelles that play such a central role into energy metabolism, control of cellular respiration, lipid metabolism, and that detoxification of reactive oxygenation species. Um, this re relationship between, you know, mitochondria and metabolism is, is um, cyclic and it's a, you know, proverbial chicken in the egg scenario because it's influenced um, by so many factors. Our metabolic rate is, is influenced, you know, things by things like our age or gender, muscle to fat ratio, amount of physical activity and hormone functioning. The imbalance of these uh, catabolic and anabolic processes can ulti ultimately lead to what we call metabolic alterations. 
these um, alterations can include, you know, resistance to um, nutrient signaling processes or pathways, so insulin resistance, disrupted lipid homeostasis. Um, so it's quite complex in that way. But the relationship between um, this cyclic relationship is particularly important because um, the mitochondria are, are so intimately responsible for the cellular bioenergetics and that metabolic precursor synthesis, the calcium regulation, um, that ROS production, immune signaling, and, and cellular apoptosis. So um, these organelles are very sensitive to oxidative stress, inflammation, um, infection, and, and that metabolic overload can lead to some of the mitochondrial impairments. So again, altered metabolism that impairs um, mitochondrial function and so on and so forth. So when those impairments in that mitochondrial function are occurring in key tissues, such as our adipose or skeletal muscle, the liver, it then leads to systemic consequences that can exacerbate or progress to basically a full-blown metabolic dysfunction that we see with you know type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, um, and obesity, thus kind of reinforcing that cycle. The mitochondria, um, just to delve into its functioning deeper, maybe this is a bit of a biochemistry um, re review for you. Uh, mitochondrial function is intricately regulated by these various metabolic processes that are influencing energy production and that nutrient utilization and overall that cellular health. When I say they're highly dynamic and social organelles, this, this is a kind of an interesting concept because they're constantly undergoing morphological changes and um, to meet that cellular homeostasis, but also in terms of communication with other organelles. And a very key one when we're thinking about metabolism is the relationship between mitochondria and the endoplasmic reticulum. And there are specific contact sites that are very important hubs for that lipid trafficking. Um, the mitochondrial dynamics and calcium signaling, which ultimately then can um, provide indications for cellular apoptosis or um, macroautophagy, uh, so that cellular clearing in the cells. There are a number of human, animal, and um, cellular studies that have kind of revealed that those metabolic alterations will perturb this um, mitochondrial and then endoplasmic reticulum contact site. So the dysregulation in any of these actions that we've we've demonstrated that that are listed here, um, whether it's due to you know nutrient imbalances or excessive oxidative stress or hormonal shifts, can then impair that mitochondrial function. So as the mitochondria are kind of, as I say, these like generals guiding the metabolism, they're the generals of this, this metabolic processes, they need to be highly responsive or they need to have highly responsive mechanisms to determine nutrient availability or nutrient sensing. Matro macroscopically, we kind of know hormone sensing is really key to this signaling, uh, you know, insulin, uh, indicating if there's enough of that energy that can then um, go into mitochondrial processes. But if we're focusing specific in, specifically on the mitochondrial sensing pathways, there's two players that really kind of emerge. There is a mechanistic tar target of rampamycin or mTOR pathway sensing that nutrient availability and promoting that um, cell growth, protein synthesis, nutrient-rich conditions. It, it's kind of activated in those nutrient-rich uh, conditions and enhancing um, anabolic processes. It favors, you know, protein lipid synthesis, and that can divert resources and energy away from that ATP energy production. And then in contrast, the low mTOR activity is um, promoting mitochondrial biogenesis and uh, autophagy or recycling of damaged um, 
mitochondria. And this then will sort of enhance that mitochondrial function. So its balance is particularly important in terms of itself. And then there's the balance and interaction with a very important AMPK sensing pathway. So AMPK shifts metabolism towards energy production and efficiency, helping the body again to maintain homeostasis. This is considered that master sensor by upregulating the mitochondrial activity and promoting the use of fats and glucose as energy sources, AMPK is ensuring that the cells, that they have the energy that they need. And um, especially in, term, in times of stress or nutrient scarcity, um, activation of this pathway is, is very important. Um, and in this way, it, it's, like I said, acting as a master energy sensor so that it's aligning mitochondrial function with those metabolic demands. It's of uh, particular importance, this, this pathway and all the players within it, because um, it's, it stimulates production of new mitochondria, which is the process known as mitochondrial genesis, biogenesis. And it's also working on a number of other mechanisms. So that is increasing that fatty acid oxidation. So switching um, cells to help you utilize the stored fat as an energy source if there's any scarcity, enhancing glucose uptake and glycolysis, improving mitochondrial efficiency, particularly of the electron transport chain, and then conserving energy by inhibiting processes that consume ATP but aren't necessarily um, immediate, immediately necessary. Thus, there's the tissue specificity for this. We know insulin signaling and other hormone regulation processes, as I kind of mentioned, are, are very important to this, um, and we will sort of discuss how they influence this in a little bit. This is a part where you're probably getting a good uh, biochemistry um, flashback to your high school biochem. So nutrient availability needs to be assessed and then mitochondrial energy production can occur. The citric acid cycle, TCA cycle, is a, a central component, of course, of that mitochondrial metabolism, generating electron carriers, these cellular currency um, uh, electron donors, the NAD+, FAD, um, FADH, and they feed into that electron transport chain of which there's, you know, the four stages and the multiple, the three complexes that are um, feeding into ATP production. The availability of some of the substrates in the citric acid cycle, like the acetyl-CoA from glucose and fatty acids. Oh my goodness, sorry. I didn't. There you go. <laughs> um, from the, the glucose and fat, so this acetyl-CoA right here, um, that is, uh, of course, going to affect the efficacy of the cycle. And actually, uh, a number of these intermediates have become big points of interest for in terms of supplementation and optimizing and ensuring that there is a proper forward motion of this cycle. And then finally, any of the complexes in the electron transport chain can be compromised due to overrunning of oxidative stress. There's a number of genetic abnormalities that can form um, within these complexes and, and this can lead to, you know, disease conditions, heritable disease conditions. So conditions um, like insulin resistance and diabetes sh that shift glucose metabolism towards anaerobic um, glycolysis reduce this mitochondrial uh, efficiency and they lead to that decreased ATP production. Uh, but then even within that, there's concerns about oxidative stress overload within these two or insufficient substrates for this cycle. And that sufficient supply of intermediates, as I've sort of alluded to, that is a important insight for a lot of um, supplementation protocols. A lot of the interest in therapeutics is around how to optimize and make the, the 
citric acid cycle very efficient. So intermediates for both the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain are targets. And in fact, Norwegian researchers published a review in 2018 suggesting that magne magnesium deficiency could drive and contribute um, to symptoms of fibro fibromyalgia through those metabolically derived myopathies that cause pain. So the review suggested that correcting this magnesium and particularly providing um, this malate form that then goes into the citric acid cycle can be particularly helpful um, and, and a key therapeutic target. So just another example of how we're applying these, this understanding and these concepts into protocols with with kind of a focus on this, these these key players, it's also really important to understand um, that the role of a very important molecule called NAD+, which is a very critical cofactor in the working of over 700 enzymes. NAD+, levels are, are particularly important as they are mediators of mitochondrial function. They operate both as coenzymes and co-substrates. They have roles in energy metabolism and efficient utilization of energy um, and that has a cascade effect in helping organs in the body function optimally um, particularly the liver kidneys cardiovascular muscle and brain and it's noteworthy that pancreatic beta islet cells are highly sensitive to systemic nad plus levels thus kind of pointing to the fact that the consequences, you know, its importance and ubiquitous nature kind of defines that the consequences of low NAD plus is associated with low energy production or low altered mitochondrial functioning. Um, and because of this, low levels of the NAD plus is thought to be, so I'm just gonna draw this, if we just wanna emphasize here, this altered mitochondrial function, wow, that is a terrible circle, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, this altered mitochondrial functioning is, is kind of associated um, with a number of diseases, disease progressions. So that includes the heart disease, stroke, uh, diabetes, obesity, cognitive and neurodegenerative diseases. And it's interesting that NAD plus becomes depleted during aging, insufficient supply of the precursor niacin. There's certain medications that can deplete it. Um, and, and you know, disorders uh, which lack NAD plus will then again exacerbate. If we are looking through, um, you know, again, therapeutic opportunities, the upregulation through dietary interventions, exercise, and therapeutics for improving the NAD plus levels are being investigated. Um, in their ability to promote mitochondrial biogenesis, and then also in protection against some of these age-related disorders right here. Um, and so this is why it's such a point of interest in a lot of longevity spaces and longevity research. As we can see here um, with the NAD+, plus, there's um, high consumption because of it acting as that co-substrate and one of the you know reasons it's such an important co-substrate is because it is um, a regulator or an activator of the sirtuin pathway. You know these critical second messengers um, and effector molecules utilize NAD plus, like I said, as a co-substrate, and that mediates a number of processes. And the sirtuins are are able to directly detect some of that that energy level and capacity. So there's that nu nutrients kind of sensing capacity. Um, but then they also are effector molecules. So they're helping to maintain that cellular homeostasis in addition to modulating DNA repair, um, the mitochondrial um, functioning, which we'll get to in a minute, and stem cell exhaustion. There, as, as you may know, are a number of uh, sirtuins that have been specifically found to regulate mitochondrial function. Um, CERT1 is kind of the one that is most well-researched um, 
among and often most talked about uh, of, of the different sirtuin proteins. It's kind of debated now um, as to resveratrol's role in activation of SIRT1 to improve that chromosomal integrity, DNA repair, and mitochondrial function. And, and why it's being hotly debated is because there was um, concerns around whether it was a direct upregulation or if um, this is an incidental increase of, of co-administration and seeing that CERT activation as kind of secondary to that, that high Mediterranean diet. So it's still remaining elusive because, again, new additional um, in vitro studies are coming out. But what is simultaneously happening is there is a CERT-5, which has emerged kind of as a central regulator of cellular energy metabolism through those direct effects on mitochondria. Um, previous studies identified it as a positive regular, regulator of complex two and promoter of that energy, um, mitochondrial energy metabolism. Now that we've kind of established, there you go. Now that we've established the importance of NAD plus levels on metabolism, on things like activation of the search pathways, um, it's important to, to recognize, you know, how we can start to um, improve its levels and and it, and why it's going down. Um, because the consequences are so dire. So one, again, area is that, that precursor supplement with the, the vitamin B3. So supplementing with just NAD plus is not, you know, feasible on commercial scale for manufacturing in terms of stability. Um, the nicotinamide ribonucleoside is being uh, positioned as well. And, and of course, you know, these are um, pathways that will then ultimately yield the NAD+. Um, NMM is proving to be um, an attractive option for supplementation as it is water-soluble, uh, highly bioavailable, and can rapidly raise those levels. It's interesting because the, the research clinical investigations being done are around, you know, age-associated tissue inflammation, um, management for insulin resistance, and improve their, you know, um, athletes are being investigated in improvements in skeletal muscle levels of NAD+. And, and there does seem to be a dose-dependent response depending on age, um, mitochondrial function status, uh, et cetera. So some very exciting, interesting research going in there. Hormonal regulation, a very um, important, I mean, I would kind of be remiss to, to not really discuss this at all, but in the interest of time and sort of the focus of this being on that mitochondrial um, functioning capacity, I do want to mention some of the relationships, um, but we won't go into tremendous depth here. Of course, insulin regulating that glucose uptake into cells, particularly that muscle and adipose tissue, stimulating that mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation, and and providing that um, that you know source or the fuel, if you will. When we see insulin resistance, the hallmark, which is kind of the hallmark of a lot of these metabolic dysfunctions, um, we see that there's an impairment, obviously, of the glucose uptake, which reduces that mitochondrial substrate availability. How this then impacts is it's shifting energy production um, to more of anaerobic glycolysis, decreasing that ATP production efficiency. Over time, what we're going to see is um, that mitochondrial biogenesis and um, functioning is reduced, and that contributes to cellular energy deficits, which over time, again, will lead to systemic metabolic dysfunction and increased fat storage. Again, that, that propagating factor. Um, declining, uh, another kind of important hormone area is growth hormone and insulin-like growth factor. Declining levels of GH and IGF-1 are seen with aging and obesity, 
Um, they're also associated with that reduced mitochondrial function as you're seeing decreased fat oxidation and there's uh, muscle atrophy that occurs. This contributes to insulin resistance, fat accumulation, and a reduced energy expenditure. Thyroid hormone is often the one that most patients will be coming in um, relating to their metabolism, you know, um, if there's significant weight gain over a period of time, thyroid uh, hormone is certainly one to investigate and look at. And understanding its role in mitochondrial, um, when it's balanced and uh, appropriately responsive, um, supporting that mitochondrial biogenesis uh, um, and oxidative metabolism. What's interesting here is that there with, with hypothyroidism, there is often a, that, again, decreased capacity and lower metabolic rate, rates are contributing very rapidly to a weight gain and fatigue. But you do need that to be a fine balance because hyperthyroid conditions are um, producing a lot more oxidative stress in a shorter period of time. And so that, so again, balance is the key. Another key hormone would be leptin, um, as we know um, from the gastric, um, gastric competency perspective. Leptin resistance is very common in obesity, and it leads to that, again, impairment of mitochondrial function. Most obese individuals actually have high circulating leptin levels, um, but the brain and tissues are, are not responding effectively. So again, leptin resistance, um, this decreases the mitochondrial biogenesis or opportunity to form new mitochondria, decreased fatty acid oxidation and impaired energy expenditure. And our big, our friend cortisol is very important in terms of, um, you know, acting as that short-term response mechanism. But of course, prolonged cortisol cortisol exposure is going to increase your fat deposition, particularly of that visceral fat. It's um, reduced mitochondrial oxidative capacity, and that's very particular to muscle and liver cells, um, promoting insulin resistance, glucose intolerance, and lipid accumulation. So this stress-induced mitochondrial dysfunction that is occurring um, is very associated with you know, fatigue, muscle weakness, and systemic inflammation. There are um, a number of other, um, you know, hormones that we can get into, uh, adiponectin, the estrogen, testosterone, they have very important roles in mitochondrial biogenesis triggers. Um, and they fluctuate as we age and they account for a lot of those sex-related metabolic alterations that then obviously play into mitochondrial functioning. So certainly these are very important targets in investigations. And all of these, uh, you know, if there is alterations in, in the balance of them or feedback systems, there is going to be a, a mitochondrial dysfunction. So it's really hard to, again, parse out um, the origin of these, you know, the mitochondrial dysfunction is always exacerbating um, or being exacerbated because of metabolic alterations and metabolic alterations will lead to either some sort of dysfunction um, or impairment in the bioenergetics and ultimately loss of ATP production. So, you know, these, these hormonal implications, um, all of these things contribute to the reservoirs or mitochondrial reservoirs um, that tend to produce these critical key secondary messengers like NAD+, the sirtuins, um, and those key effector molecules, they are, are altered. And so we get these significant alterations in both cellular and then overall physiological processes. And we may be moving or shifting more towards anabolic processes uh, where there is building or growth or um, a you know, fatty acid accretion, there is a uh, build up without proper breakdown. Um, and that can lead to, again, a lot of the, the physical changes that the patients are experiencing. So the, the key kind of to understand is that, you know, 
um, overexpression of these deficiencies or of some of those key molecules um, that can lead to contributions in um, you know the pathogenesis or development of these diseases because these signaling pathways are no longer as sensitive. With this impaired bioenergetics, well, rather, I'll just take a step back. The, the biogenic, bioenergetics of the mitochondria become impaired usually when the nutrients needs either exceed the utilization and storage, um, if, which results in those resistant sensing pathways or miscommunication um, between or disruption of the communication between the mitochondria and other organelles, specifically that endoplasmic reticulum, and of course that overload of oxidative stress. And because all these start to accumulate these threats, if you will, the mitochondrial genome, as we know, is unique to the mitochondria. Um, it's highly susceptible to mutation and the frequency of mitochondrial uh, DNA mutations is associated with select human diseases, including various encephalopathies, uh, neuropathies, and cardiomyopathies. So how do we start to um, assess or understand the, the threats? Well, first, as, as I've mentioned a few times now, the mitochondria are, are major sources of the reactive oxygenation species formation, um, which are, again, the byproduct of the oxidative force uh, phosphorylation. So anticipated and um, uh, well understood to be normal parts of this, particularly in the electron transport chain. The low levels are acting as that signal molecule, but excessive da um, damage will ultimately lead to stress, oxidative stress, and damage that mitochondrial DNA, protein, lipid, and impair, ultimately impair function. So the goal is then um, activate or have cellular antioxidant defenses. Um, so we have the superoxide dismutase, we have um, the pathways to neutralize these, these species that are produced. And the chronic oxidative stress can that's leading to mitochondrial function that ex expedites aging and metabolic disease can be mitigated somewhat by um, antioxidant defenses, which have a number of pathways that will um, reduce cellular energy, injury, rather, um, and then prevent that, that ultimate DNA damage. So very important to have, um, you know, antioxidant competency when we are discussing, um, you know, the, the dietary and, and lifestyle factors that will protect mitochondria. We also know another important threat, um, particularly to that mitochondrial endoplasmic reticulum crosstalk directly at that point that leads to a greater, you know, if we're disrupting that, that leads to a greater mitochondrial dysfunction is elevations in homocysteine. Homocysteine is widely accepted as a risk factor in metabolic diseases as it affects that normal mitochondrial function and structure and functioning, um, including that energy production and the dynamics, like I said, with um, the other organelles and, and can trigger that, um, that so with its combination with the reactive oxygenation species are kind of mediators of that injury. And um, it can lead to a membrane depolarization and apoptosis. So this really underpins the fact that, hey, we need to ensure that proper homocysteine recycling is, that, that there's proper homocysteine recycling strategy is in place. And again, we have built these, but um, many of you are probably familiar with this chart in terms of identifying the critical players, folate, B6, vitamin B12, um, that helped us identify why, why this recycling is so important and how supplementation can shift and support this. Um, I know we speak a lot about folate's role in this um, recycling. I do want to take a moment to just discuss the B12 forms specifically. As we know, cobalamin is available in you know three forms: hydroxy, adenosyl, and methyl. And why having a tricobalamin um, 
option for patients is particularly important. And that is because ultimately this formation of adenosylcobalamin, um, which is a major form of B12, is found within the mitochondria and supports that, that energy production, it supports um, metabolism um, at that mitochondrial level. And its use also within um, the propanoate pathway as if we look here, um, as a cofactor for the conversion of the methylmalonyl-CoA into succinyl-CoA is very important for odd chain fatty acid um, and carbohydrate and amino acid metabolism. So um, again, this underpins why we would we would also want both methylcobalamin and adenosylcobalamin because, again, the methylcobalamin is mediating that homocysteine to methionine, um, and then adenosylcobalamin has that um, activation and support within mitochondria. If we're thinking about uh, strategies for mitigating oxidative damage, we, you know, ensuring that oxidative stress is managed and that there's a key flow there. Um, the body has developed, again, um, the or cellular components have developed this ability to self-clean, self self, um, they're very efficient at self-cleaning, or they should be in metabolic dysfunctions or metabolic alterations can reduce this ability to um, properly do that cellular clearance. You know, they act very um, annoyingly by blocking some of these pathways. And it's interesting because a lot of um, the, the new considerations in, you know, um, drug management or even uh, nutraceuticals are trying to target or optimize this, this process of autophagy. So, the antioxidants are great, but we also want to mitigate damage from a dysfunctional mitochondria, and that requires um, that removal of those worn out organelles um, or damaged molecules like DNA, um, protein, and RNA. The specific um, clearance uh, or recycling uh, uh, for mitochondria is, wouldn't you know it, called mitophagy. And so autophagy relates to the entire cell functioning. Mitophagy is specific to mitochondrial function. And it's essentially making room or driving mitochondrial biogenesis, either because there is a lack or reduction in efficacy. Um, but we really want to make sure that this pathway is um, balanced and that um, we have more energy production or there's more catabolic requirements so that we can um, sort of optimize this. The pink one, Parkin signaling access, is particularly important. There are dependent and independent pathways for stimulating mitophagy, but I think what's uh, particularly important to note is that when we have dysfunctional mitophagy, so either that pink one Parkin is um, blocked or um, there's excessive oxidative stress that builds up and blocks this pathway, um, one of those genes are dysfunctional for, for this process, there is differing impacts on differing tissues and it's very bi-directional. So for example, in muscle tissues, if we look um, here in this first category, there is, if there's dysfunctional mitophagy, it can drive uh, sarcopenia, inflammatory myopathies. And as mentioned, it's because it's bi-directional, when we see insulin resistant conditions, um, when we see an obesity type two diabetes are characterized by altered muscle expression of that mitochondrial um, endoplasmic reticulum contact. So that's how they're blocking mitophagy there. Now, the, the consequences of that dysfunctional mitophagy, like I said, are tissue specific. And then um, the metabolic consequences on systems or organ systems is that while in the liver, there's a reduced gene expression of the mitophagy receptor, um, this will then lead to increased hepatocyte mitochondrial oxidative, um, the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which has 
increased uh, hepatocyte mitochondrial oxidative capacity, which is trying to compensate for excess lipid availability. So while there is more mitochondria, they're just less efficient. Normally, these would then be um, subject to mitophagy, but that process is not working, as we saw. So it's less efficient, and then you get higher levels of reactive oxygenation species. In type 2 diabetes and um, insulin resistance, there's a blunting of that pink one parkin dependent mitophagy in the liver and no protection of beta cells. Polyamines are really important in terms of protecting um, the DNA. And if we have impaired mitophagy, um, specifically, you know, due to this my mitochondrial dysfunction, and in addition to, you know, reducing oxidative stress, we need to be able to induce um, mitophagy and autophagy. Polyamine consumption is being investigated for this. And um, there's some really interesting data coming out about how these small positively charged molecules stabilize and protect RNA, DNA, and it's very important for cell growth, cell repair, and the maintenance of transport channels. Um, and spermidine is kind of the one that is gaining the most notoriety in that. So polyamines to induce cellular autophagy for um, you know, more specific to um, mitophagy, urolithin A is a gut microbiome derived metabolite of elegitanins. Elegitanins are polyphenolic compounds that we see present in foods such as pomegranates, almonds, walnuts, um, and it's being investigated for its role specifically in mitochondrial function in relation to the gut, something called the gut muscle access. So it's being thought to improve muscle quality and strength by enhancing that mitophagy, increasing the mitochondrial content, um, and upregulating specifically mitophagy-related genes in skeletal muscle. That's um, one of the pathways, and that uh, enhances that muscle regeneration. So really interesting molecule there. When we're assessing, I think, uh, you know, mitochondrial dysfunction presents with such a wide variety and range of symptoms that depending on tissue type um, that are most affected, it's going to make it fairly difficult to diagnose on symptomology alone. But there are some of, of these noted um, in terms of widespread manifestations of it. Further uh, assessment would relate to some of those key indicators, lactate and pyruvate. Um, that, that ratio, uh, if you see an abnormal lactate to pyruvate ratio, we can um, indicate mitochondrial dysfunction as there's more anaerobic glycolysis occurring in producing that excess uh, lactate. We also can see in serum alanine, increased serum alanine will reflect a compensatory shift in, into amino acid metabolism due to that impaired mitochondrial function. And this is usually also seen alongside that elevation in lactate. Um, creatinine kinase or CK is indicative of some of that muscle damage, so particularly with mitochondrial myopathies, but it's not specific only to mitochondrial dysfunction, so certainly wouldn't rule, um, specifically just rule it in. Uh, acyl carnitine analysis can be done in both blood and urine. Um, it can help detect the abnormalities that are occurring in fatty acid oxidation elevations in uh, specific acyl carnitines may indicate a impaired beta oxidation. We know um, we can also be testing, you know, CoQ10, which is a key component of the ETC and oxidative stress markers are very important uh, in assessing mitochondrial dysfunction. Markers uh, would include the MDA or the O8 OHDG, which, um, again, assess that oxidative damage to the lipid protein or DNA. Um, there are also some lab or functional testing options that are available that are a bit more um, in depth, but these might be less accessible to patients. You can also uh, start to 
look into uh, an assessment of their antioxidant intake by assessing something called the ORAC score or the antioxidant strength. A standard North American diet is about 1,200 um, ORAC units per day, and uh, assessment of a diet diary can really help identify if they need to increase antioxidants. And there's a number of um, tools that help identify ORAC scores of different food groups. Additionally, the insulin resistance can be assessed based off of serum glucose or insulin response um, and oral glucose tolerance tests, which we're probably all fairly familiar with. Assessing that metabolic uh, syndrome alongside mitochondrial dysfunction, we really need to be making sure we're ruling out and managing the hormonal dysregulation component. Um, and doing that metabolic syndrome assessment with anthropomorphic parameters. We have already discussed many of the strategies for promoting mitochondrial recovery. That includes providing that sufficient intermediates um, for the citric acid cycle and the electron transport, including that magnesium, acetyl-CoA, CoQ10. Um, supporting nutrient sensing pathways, again, for that AMPK, uh, we need to ensure critical cofactors such as NAD plus is available through, you know, things like NMN supplementation. We um, want to ensure that we're providing a diet with a high ORAC score for those antioxidants to reduce the uh, damage from oxidative stress. Reducing that inflammasome again, because that will block that uh, efficacy, uh, preventing other threats like, um, you know, from homo homocysteine recycling, ensuring that is properly moving forward with B12, B6, folate. We've um, discussed the opportunity to improve mitochondrial homeostasis through the activation of autophagy and specifically um, through polyamines and like spermidine and urolithins like urolithin A. And then of course, metabolic management of hormone homeostasis kind of on this side is, is really looking at that hormone homeostasis, body composition um, via adjustments in those macronutrient consumption and excretion pathways. So again, in the interest of time, we're going to focus a little bit on providing some of those cofactors or depleted nutrients because of this escalated catabolic demands, bioenergetic depletion, calcium overload, and oxidative stress. We know that deficiencies then occur in macro and micronutrients. Um, focusing specifically on uh, one carnitine, which is involved, as we know, in transport of long chain fatty acids into the mitochondria that offers cellular protection by restricting the accretion of these fatty acids. So again, we're, we're breaking down instead of building um, up and making bulky. Carnitine levels, as we um, may know, is they decrease with age. So supplementation, especially in older populations and vegetarians, might be effective. Specifically, the preferred form is um, right now being investigated is Alcar or acetyl L-carnitine as it seems to be more easily absorbed and crosses into the blood-brain barrier. That acetyl group is um, beneficial in producing acetylcholine and then acetyl-CoA. In an animal study, they found that um, Alcar was a bit more effective than um, L-carnitine at decreasing some of the oxidative damage, specifically in the brain. Coenzyme Q10, we've mentioned briefly um, because it's so important for complex one, two, and three in the electron transport chain. Um, while we're currently also providing antioxidant prevent, uh, protection to those cell membranes and suppressing that lipid peroxidation Ubiquinol is being suggested in aging populations for orocyte maturation and um, in those kind of with more mitochondrial dysfunction or suspected of more dysfunction um, as it does exist in these three distinct oxidation states. There, there seems to be some evidence that this would be the preferred form. What's um, also quite interesting is mitochondrial targeting. Um, on a manufacturing note, there's a lot of targeting technologies being developed, um, such as with this um, 
this molecule called TPP that helps deliver small molecules and um, relies on the stability of this moiety in biological systems to help um, essentially just target things like resveratrol, vitamin E, quinone, um, and, and even some drugs into the mitochondria. So this is still in its infancy, this, this technology being developed, but what's interesting is uh, we're starting to see again technology and industry is trying to match and meet that. Um, I want to briefly speak to riboflavin as it doesn't get talked about as much. Um, it supports that activation and conversion of both the B vitamins, particularly tryptophan to niacin, and with that absorption and activation of B1, B3, folate, and B6. It's particularly important in energy production, metabolism, and cellular development, and is a cofactor, um, particularly in complex one and two of the ETC. When we're speaking to metabolic interventions, of course, we want to address the reducing um, the antioxidants to reduce that damage, elevating the ORAC score. Um, and we'll speak um, to two interventions. One would be AMLA. AMLA has a very high ORAC score um, and ability to kind of mop up toxins. It's, it should be noted that traditionally with standardized to vitamin C content. This fruit um, is very rich in a lot of antioxidants, but um, studies are showing that actually supporting the beta glucogallin and gallic acids, um, these hydrolyzable tannins are probably more important and well-researched in terms of cardiovascular and blood sugar management. And it's their combined antioxidant effect that seems to be helpful in metabolic disorders. So. Very interesting research coming out there. And then um, we know curcumin in relation to anti-inflammatory function with that inflammasome. Um, but tetrahydrocurcumin is a reduced form of curcumin. It's colorless. And this new form, I know everybody's saying a new form of curcumin. Oh my gosh. Um, but again, it is, it is naturally produced. It's usually produced uh, in the gut. And um, it seems that this antioxidant, it has higher antioxidant capacity than curcumin, um, and it has strong lipid peroxidation uh, capacity. It also has been specifically studied in improving glucose levels in plasma insulin, and most of these studies are preclinical studies, so interesting research coming out there. And um, this seems to be related to increasing action of beta cells to enhance transportation of glucose, blood glucose to peripheral tissues, um, so potentially through that GLUT4 pathway. Another one that we can't not talk about is um, when we're speaking to you know metabolic functioning is something that's garnered a lot of popularity, which is berberine, and we we need to when we're focusing on supporting the mitochondria, also be modulating those anthropomorphic parameters like body composition, um, obviously through through those mitochondrial nutrient sensing pathways um, to support that increasing catabolism. Berberine was traditionally used as an antimicrobial and has history, history of use for treatment of diabetes and um, lipid management. The the benefits in terms of uh, mitochondrial function are again with this this AMPK activation. I don't know if you can see in this, um, and that is supporting that immune response, mitigating the inflammatory process, and then also helps shifting and modulating the gut bacteria um, in and of itself to support those that help with uh, metabolism and and potentially weight loss things like that. Interventions, just reviewing this, we have addressed so many strategies. Uh, just to recap, you always wanna improve the mitochondrial recovery through supporting that energy production pathway with those key cofactors or depleted nutrients. Um, we also want to induce and ensure mitochondrial homeostasis through processes like ensuring my, uh, mitophagy and nutrient signaling pathways, particularly the AMPK is running smoothly. Mitigating the threats um, that active mitochondrial function yield. So that would be reducing that oxidative stress and inflammation. Um, 
and ensuring proper crosstalk between the other organelles, um, so management of homocysteine. And then, of course, metabolic management is through balanced consumption of macros, um, making sure that our hormone signaling pathways and anthropomorphic measures are being balanced and addressed. Quite a lot to go through, but this was very much to be a um, prep for you. Um, hopefully this will induce many to dive deeper. I have a number of references listed here, and um, I thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my goodness. What an incredible and de um, deep presentation. <laughs> Excellent. So anyone can pop their questions into the Q&A and please do. We have just a couple minutes. Um, let's see. So one of the first questions I have is while undergoing mitochondrial recovery therapeutics, what are some metrics for success or improvements? Yeah, I think um, because there's so much variability, uh, tissue variability, we want to really do that, that um, the key baseline assessments, again, for, for assessing and understanding how dysfunctional mitochondrial, the mitochondria was. Um, so when we're introducing therapeutics, there needs to be a, a measured response as well. So what that looks like is reassessing probably after um, three months, six months, nine months. Um, and most of these interventions, I, I kind of view as slower and maybe not as immediate effects. Like this is more the slow medicine because you're working on really deep dysfunctions that are occurring on a cellular level. So for them to then manifest as uh, organ specific or changing physiology usually takes some period of time, but ensuring that um, patients are still monitoring measures like energy, um, how fast they fatigue in, in terms of um, exercise tolerance, and again, uh, having them keep visual analog scores of those key uh, concerns that they had early on. But with each of those interventions, again, you're going to see variations in how long they should be taking it. Um, but generally, there's there's a longer term supplementation approach with mitochondrial dysfunction. Excellent. Valeria asks, uh, she says, thank you, or they say thank you. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend cycling berberine? Yes, um, and I think part of that is due to its its beneficial mechanism of action. Now, I think historically in school, I don't know about you guys, but I was taught, um, you know, you want to reassess because these are alkaloids. They, you want to assess liver function and potentially take breaks um, every three months. There have been some studies where there's 12 months continuous use um, without those negative impacts. Um, on liver. But like I said, the alteration in gut microbiota, there's an opportunity or potential to, you know, maybe overcorrect. Mm -hmm. So I do think it's worth um, cycling, taking a pause and reassessing, and then, um, you know, getting back on it. Also, this might be a bias of mine, but I prefer to cycle supplements anyway, um, just to assess for a correction of some of those. Um, and as I've kind of demonstrated with the mitochondria, it's such a balancing act and there's overcorrection can sometimes exacerbate or worsen the mitochondrial dysfunction. So we don't want to overcorrect into too much catabolism and then that'll influence our metabolism anyway. Excellent, thank you. Uh, I know we're just about at time, but we've got just a couple questions if everybody's able to stay with us. Um, Matthew asks, any data in micro nanoplastic accumulation in the mitochondria? Micro nanoplastic accumulation. Um, this, I, I think in terms of environmental medicine, this is an area we are um, seeing a lot more growth in, particularly because of that highly mutable mitochondrial DNA, as I mentioned. Um, there does seem to be some concerns, one about the um, 
again, that crosstalk, particularly with endoplasmic reticulum, there might be some concern about microplastics disrupting that. But in in all honesty, I I don't know the full um, detail of that or impact, but there is a highly probable um, risk there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Tara asks, can you comment further on an oral NADH versus NAD plus, or would you just stick with the NMN, et cetera? Yeah, so I think with oral supplementation, um, the precursors, the, the niacin, the NMN or the NR, uh, seem to be the better options. Um, potential, I've seen, you know, some good research in IV situations where they're using NADH um, as a push. And um, if that's well tolerated, it can be beneficial. But uh, to be honest, I think from a supplementation, oral supplementation perspective, it would be the, um, the latter. Excellent. All right, we'll do one more question here. So um, Chanchal asks, can you, uh, you can consider long-term whole herb rather than isolates for longer-term use. Do you agree with that? Sorry, long-term whole herb for which one? Um, you uh, considering using the whole her herb, excuse me, rather than isolates for longer-term use. Of berber? I believe so. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so uh, I think... The, the jury is out still on that. A lot of the research that is being done is on isolates of either berberine HCL, um, but berberine containing berberine containing plants like barberry um, certainly ha there's like much to be said about that synergy of components. Um, yeah, so I'm still kind of awaiting definitive research there. <laughs> Excellent. And a great topic potentially for another webinar in the future. Yeah. <laughs> See, see what I mean is we can just go down so many rabbit holes with this and each of those slides probably could be like a full, you know, presentation on its own. So I appreciate that everyone stuck around. And um, if you need to review some of those notes or would like to see some of those references, um, there's that reference page on there because there's a lot of images. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you so much to everyone who joined us today. And thank you so much also to Dr. Navnarat for this wonderful presentation. Um, everyone look out uh, in their email with a link to view this recording within a couple of days. And anyone who has any additional questions can send them over to me at Amy Regan, that's A-M-Y dot Regan, R-E-G-A-N at fullscript.com. Hope everyone enjoyed the presentation as much as I did. And do you have any sort of closing thoughts for us? Protect your mitochondria. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's always a little surprise I like to add in that. Uh, Just an easy thing here. to do. Uh, yeah. And I think, again, we can, it's very easy to complicate this, um, but most of those mechanisms to protect a mitochondria are the things that we're already promoting, exercise, movement. It's just understanding that biochemistry behind why those are so effective and important. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, and uh, have a great afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.